Nietzsche's guide for getting over a heartbreak. A video title you didn't expect to see, and a video you didn't know you needed. If you're familiar with the work of Friedrich Nietzsche, you probably don't consider him a thinker that you would go for relationship advice to. However, since heartbreak is one of the most relatable human experiences, and also one of the most painful, you decided to put your suspicion aside and give Nietzsche a chance. Thank you for that. I'm here to prove you right. Here is what exactly I want to talk to you about. I want to lay out one of Nietzsche's ugliest and seemingly most offensive ideas. And once again, if you read Nietzsche, you know that he has some ugly and offensive ideas. I want to reframe this idea to show you how it can be used in your life. Then I want to put it in the context of heartbreak and explain why Nietzsche is actually someone you would want to listen on this topic, even though you don't consider him a love expert. Then, lastly, and probably most importantly, I want to provide encouragement so that you know you'll be able to deal with, hard, with the heartbreak that you're going through right now, or maybe the heartbreak or heartbreaks that you will be going through in the future. But first, if you're new here and you're wondering if this is going to be the, a waste of your time, let's see, who am I? My name is David, known online as Recovering Overthinker. That has been my pen name for the last four and a half years, writing every single day on Instagram and almost two years writing long form essays on Substack. I have around 300 long form pieces on Substack that maybe you will want to read at some point. But for now, I don't want to brag with vanity metrics. However, maybe it's useful for you to know that there is a decent amount of people who think that what I have to say is valuable and interesting. So maybe give it a chance and take at least a couple of minutes to see if what I'm saying resonates with you and if you find it useful. My mission, what am I doing here? First of all, I'm here to convince you that your life is worth living because we know very well that we have a, an epidemic today of people who don't consider their lives worth living. Then I want to make you live like it. It's enough, not enough to say that your life is worth living. We could go on the street and how many people would answer that, yeah, their life is worth living, but when you look at the way that they live their life, they're not acting like it. They're not living like it. They have this passive, sad existence that cannot be really called a full life. Then I want to help you get unstuck. And you know very well what that means. Help you fully engage in life, experience life in its entirety, take risks, try to become everything that you are capable of becoming. Last but not least, I want to get you to do the same for others because this is not about me helping you and staying at that. This is about you becoming the person who is capable of helping others. And in the process, I'm sure that you will help me. Even what you watching this and you being interested in this topic is helping me, encourage, encouraging me to keep doing my work. So once again, this is going to be a two-way street and hopefully we are going to spread help and encouragement to other people. Today's topic. This is what I think today's topic covers. Convince you that your life is worth living because we know that when, because we know how painful a heartbreak can be and can lead you to thinking that you cannot go on living like this. Second, help you get unstuck. Sometimes people spend years and even decades uh, not being able to recover from their heartbreak and move on with their life. So this is what I, what I see uh, today's topic covering. However, maybe you see it in a different way. So again, here you see a question. What do you think? What do you think today's topic covers? Maybe more than these two. Uh, I will try to explain this in every video that I make so that you know in advance if this is something that you're interested in, if this is the type of help you need. So I want to uh, I want to lay out what part or parts of my mission topic for every video uh, relates to. Why do I care? Why do I want to do this? Because I felt what it's like not wanting to live. I felt what it's like wanting to live but not knowing what to do. I felt what it's like knowing what to do but feeling stuck not able to get going, to move forward. 
I felt what it's like being lost and confused. I felt what it's like after all of this, going to bed happy and waking up excited to face another day. As always, I will say, if this fifth stage seems unrealistic to you, trust me, I really have been through all of these stages and I know that if you feel right now like your life is a mess, you are a mess, I'm confident that you can become this person who is going to bed and you cannot wait to wake up, to face another day, engage, engage with uh, challenges in front of you, or take on new opportunities, set new goals, move forward. I know you can get to that point. Please comment what stage you are on. And I like to say, if you're on the fifth stage and you think, okay, this guy, he's not able to help me. I'm already at the point where he is at in life. That's great. You can end this video, move on with your life, do great things, or I challenge you to stick around and engage because maybe you will get an opportunity to help someone that I am not able to help. To help. Because I don't claim to know everything. I'm not a guru. So if you stick around, maybe you will get the chance to help me, help other people in the comments. So that's that's a challenge. Why should you listen to me if all of this is not enough, enough context for you to be interested in what I have to say? Here are a couple of more points. I'm still on my journey, so I'm inviting you to join and to be my fellow explorer of human existence, as maybe you've noticed in my Instagram bio. Explorer of human existence. I'm inviting you to go on this journey with me. I'm not trying to be uh, your guru. I'm not interested in becoming a guru or having a cult. I don't want you to worship me. I don't want you to think that I'm all-knowing. No, I'm a human. However, I'm a human who has had enough free time and has made the effort to create enough free time in his life and he said curiosity and maybe, maybe some intellectual capacity to constantly educate myself, to think, write and read on topics that you care about. One of them being this right now, heartbreak. So further, I have used the knowledge from books in real life because I know you are fed up with two types of influencers, gurus, coaches, people who have zero real life experience and just talk about what they have read or people who kind of go through life mindlessly and they just think that they can figure out everything without putting in the effort to educate themselves. Again, I don't think I'm better than you or anyone else, but I know that I have put in the effort to establish this balance between education and real life, between thinking and acting. So maybe some notable, not really accomplishments, but points from my life resume. Survived having a price on my head, restarted my life on the other side of the world, I would say without any connections, without any real foundation, pinching myself every morning to make sure it's all real. I have to emphasize this last part. I'm not pinching myself because I live uh, in a villa with a pool and I drive a Lambo. No, I pinch myself every morning because I'm, I'm able to talk to people from different parts of the world, to reach people from all different uh, socioeconomic backgrounds, different uh, life circumstances, to reach them, to touch their minds and hearts, if I can say so. I'm pitching myself every morning because I'm living with purpose and I truly love my life after not even wanting to live. That's my success story. Again, I, I cannot teach you how to make 100k per month and how to buy a Lambo or a Bugatti. So I think the one of the combining threads between between all of these is that I am not I am not a guru that I know a lot of you are fed up with the type of who is expecting you to worship him. So that's not me. Let's note before we start, congratulations on being amongst the select few who are interested in topics like this one and have the attention span to watch a long form educational video. We need more people like you in this world. And this is not uh, to 
some cheap flattery. This is not just to make you feel good. This is true. This is an urgent matter that we need more people who are able to redirect their attention to something that is useful for them. Let's begin. A human being who strives for something great considers everyone he meets on his way either as a means or a delay and obstacle or as a temporary resting place, said Friedrich Nietzsche in Beyond Good and Evil. So let's break this apart. Means, delay or obstacle, resting place. So what Nietzsche is proposing is that if you are an ambitious individual who is striving for something great, every person in your life is either a means, something that you will use for your own advancement, or delay or an obstacle, someone getting in your way, someone holding you back, wasting your time. So we have means, someone use, use for your advancement, delay or obstacle, someone wasting your time, holding you back, not helping you on your journey of moving forward. And resting place, we can use it as temporary fun and enjoyment, but then I would put it in the category of means as well. So just to make this easier and easier to understand, why is this problematic? I mean, think about it. Is this how we want to view ourselves? That every single person in your life is an object, literally an object that either helps you move forward or holds you back. Not just helps you move forward, but that's their whole purpose. It's a problematic problematic quote, problematic idea. This is one of the ideas that uh, Nietzsche gets a lot of hate for, at least by people who have read Nietzsche, actually, because a lot of people who hate Nietzsche haven't read any of any of him. But people who have read him, this is something that they don't appreciate. They don't appreciate him uh, proposing that if you are a great human being, you're going to view everyone else through the lens of what you want and need in life. I am here to make the case that we can reframe this idea and use it uh, as a force of good. We will focus on the means part of this idea, not the delay and obstacle, because we can all recognize that there are actually people in our lives who are holding us back and hindering our development. So we can agree that when Nietzsche says, there are people who you can view as delays and obstacles on your journey. It's not not so controversial. All of you have experienced some people who, you know, you've maybe, I don't want to go too dark, but were abused by some people, bullied by some people. Yeah, why not view them as, as uh, delays and obstacles on your journey? However, when it comes to means, can we really go through life viewing people as as objects that we are going to use in order to move forward and then we discard them. Last reminder, before diving in more deeply, uh, I will not be playing Nietzsche's advocate, even though sometimes, since I've been writing about him for the past four and a half years, I've been accused of being, a, of being Nietzsche's advocate. I will not be playing one and I'm not going to justify. I'm not going to say, oh no, no, Nietzsche actually meant something uh, much more innocent with his quote. No, I'm using his quote to help us. We want to use Nietzsche's idea for our own goal or goals. So we'll be playing the Uno reverse card on Nietzsche and using him as means to our own end. So let's dive into it. The first part of the quote read, a human being who strives for something great human being who strives for something great. What does it mean to strive for something great? Because we cannot go deeper into this discussion if we don't, if we are not on the same page of what, what is even striving for something great? Who is this individual who is striving for something great? Then we can discuss, okay, how can this individual position themselves in a way that everyone else is a mean to their end. Striving for something great, having a project, a worthy goal. We can all agree on that. Striving for something great. 
It literally means having a great project, a worthy goal that you are striving for, wanting to move towards. However, what is a great project? What is a worthy goal? Let's get on the same page. For Nietzsche, the greatest thing to strive for, the greatest project and goal that you can have is life affirmation. To be able to say yes to your life with everything it entails. We are going to break this idea down, especially for those of you who haven't read Nietzsche. But I think even those of you who have read him, it's going to be interesting and useful so that we know what life affirmation means. What does it mean to say yes to your life? So here is a quote from Eke Omo. My formula for greatness in a human being is amor fati. That one wants nothing to be different. Nothing to be different. Not forward, not backward. Not in all eternity. Not merely bear what is necessary. Still let's conceal it. But love it. Amor fati. You have heard about amor fati. I'm sure about it. Initially, we see this idea expressed in Stoic philosophy. I'm not sure who uh, gave it more popularity, Stoics or Nietzsche, but either way, if you have heard about Amor Fati previously, it had to be either from Stoics or from Nietzsche. Amor Fati cannot be separated. So Nietzsche's idea of Amor Fati, he, that he talks about a lot, as his formula for greatness, his goal, that's life affirmation. It cannot be separated from his idea of eternal recurrence, what he called his deepest thought. So let's address eternal recurrence. Don't be, don't be intimidated by this long quote. If you are watching this and not just listening, we will break it down. It, it will be easy to understand. In gay science, Nietzsche says, what if a demon crept up uh, crept after you in your lon loneliest loneliness some day or night and said to you, this life as you live it at present and have lived it, you must live it once more and also innumerable times and there will be nothing new in it, nothing new, but every pain and every joy and every thought and every sigh and all the unspeakably small and great in thy life must come to you again and all in the same series and sequence and similarly this spider and this moonlight among the this moonlight among the trees and similarly this moment and i myself the eternal sand glass of existence will ever be turned once more and you with it you speck of dust would you not throw yourself down and gnash your teeth and curse the demon that uh, so spoke or have you once experienced a tremendous moment in which you would answer him, you are a god and, and never did I hear anything so divine. Thank you for sticking around to hear the full quote, but if you're having, if it's a bit overwhelming, let me break it down. What if you were told that you will have to repeat your life with every single detail being exactly the same and repeat it into eternity, meaning that you will experience all the pain, suffering, all the insecurity, doubt, all the anxiety, depression, everything, infinite times more. Of course, also all the joy, happiness, fun. How we as humans naturally focus on the negative. If you were told that you're going to relive your life exactly as it was and as it is, infinite times more, how would you react to it? Would you view it as the biggest curse or as the biggest blessing? This is Nietzsche's idea of eternal recurrence. If you are able to affirm the eternal recurrence, if you're able to say, yes, I want to relive my life exactly as it was and as it is infinite times, then you are a life affirmer. This cannot be separated from Amor Fati. There is no Amor fati without eternal recurrence, there is no eternal recurrence without amor fati. You cannot, uh, there is no this comes first, this comes second. So these two ideas are in constant interplay. That's eternal recurrence. If you want to be a, able to affirm your life, to say yes to, uh, to eternal recurrence, 
to say Amor Fati, you must engage in the process of self-creation. Another Nietzschean concept, we will have to make a separate video discussing just self-creation. But in short, you have to create yourself into a character and your life into a story. It's something that a lot of people overlook in Nietzsche. You are constantly challenged by him to become a character and for your life to be a story. A story that, in the context of eternal recurrence, a story that you would want to relive over and over and over again. I put it here. Amor Fati, eternal recurrence, self-creation, life affirmation, these ideas cannot be separated from each other. That's the beauty and complexity of Nietzsche. I believe if you want to study Nietzsche, you have to read all of him, all of his works. Maybe not the most encouraging fact for people who just want to uh, quickly consume content, quickly consume information and wisdom, but that's the challenge of, of getting f really familiar with what Nietzsche is all about. Okay, now we are getting a hang of what is what, the, what does it mean for Nietzsche when he says a person who is striving for something great. The prime example of a human being who strives for something great is the person who is engaging in the process of self-creation so that they can affirm life and say yes to everything that is happening to them. So here, a question for you. Is this a bit different from what you imagined when you initially heard the full quote at the beginning? You know, a human being who strives for something great, views everyone as means or delay an obstacle. Is this a bit different? That a human being who strives for something great isn't necessarily someone looking to conquer the world or to make millions and billions. It's quote unquote just a person who wants to be able to look at their life and all the pain and say, yes, I own this. This is my life and I love every single second of it. And I would relive it over and over and over again. Now, hard break. Okay, now we understand what does it mean to strive for something great? Who is this individual for, for, who is striving for something great? Who should look at other people as means? Let's, let's put, put it in the context of heartbreak and see how it can help you. I put here, what does heartbreak have to do with Nietzsche and further with his idea of viewing people as means? And why can Nietzsche offer good heartbreak advice? This is going to be interesting. I am almost absolutely confident that you are someone who is interested in Nietzsche and has watched a lot of lectures on Nietzsche and a lot of educational YouTube videos, maybe read some blog articles. I am almost confident that you have never heard Nietzsche discussed in, in, in this light, in this aspect. If I am correct, please let me know in the comments. In 1882, Nietzsche met a psychoanalyst and essayist named Lou Andres Salome. It is said that he instantly fell in love with her, and during the summer they spent together, two of them and another friend, he proposed marriage to her on at least two separate occasions, but was rejected. She was interested in him only as a friend and a profound thinker. To put it simply, Nietzsche got friend-zoned, but he being the intense person that he was, this didn't sit well with him, because he... And maybe some of you can relate. He, he took off the brakes and he dove deep into love or at least the fantasy of love. Of fantasy of what love with this person could be like. After Nietzsche and she parted ways, he fell into a period of mental anguish. It ended up being one of the most difficult periods of his life. As he testifies both in his writing and his personal letter to friends. In his writing, you will notice that this is a problematic period for Nietzsche. However, he doesn't talk about what is going on in his life. This is where his letters come into play. And a lot of people are not aware of Nietzsche's letters. So let's see a letter from December of 8082. Nietzsche looking back on this uh, problematic, painful summer. This last morsel of life was the hardest I have yet had to chew, 
and it is still possible that I shall choke on it. I have suffered from the humiliating and tormenting memories of this summer as from a bout of madness. Vocabulary word, word morsel, a small piece or amount, usually of food. So it fits into this, this last morsel of life was the hardest I have yet to chew and maybe it's still possible that I shall choke on it. He continues in the latter part of in the latter part of this letter. I'm exerting every ounce of my self-mastery, but I have lived in solitude too long and fed too long of my own fat, so that I am now being broken as no other man could be on the wheel of my own passions. If only I could sleep. But the strongest doses of my sedative help me as little as my six to eight hours of daily walking. Here you're, you're getting a getting to know a new side of Nietzsche, side that is, again, that is not talked about enough. He was a human, just like all of us. He was a bombastic thinker, one of the most influential thinkers of all times, but he was a human just like you and me. Can you relate to these quotes? Because I, when I'm reading this, I'm you know thinking about my heartbreaks, I'm thinking about my friends suffering from a heartbreak. You know, Here when he says, I have lived in solitude too long and fed too long of my own fat, so that I am now being broken as no other man could be on the wheel of my own passions. You know, when, when you have been so long without a partner, without love, without romantic interest, and then you find someone and you think this is it. So because you've been so lonely, you dive deep into it. You dive deep into it. And then the chances are that you can get crushed, obliterated. That's what happened to him as a lonely thinker. He gave love a chance as a lonely thinker who got used to his solitude. He decided to be vulnerable, vulnerable and try to have something with this person. I think all of you can relate. And this is beautiful to see that one of the greatest thinkers of all time was just a person like you who was deeply hurt by, by love or the lack of love coming from from the other person. However, out of this suffering emerges what he calls his greatest gift to humanity in the book Das Spoke Zarathustra. So Das Spoke Zarathustra is directly related to this period of suffering. It, it was his cure. It was his remedy, his antidote, uh, his we can even say coping mechanism. So thus spoke Zarathustra, one of the most brilliant works, not just one of his best work, but one of the most brilliant, and I wouldn't even say philosophical works because it's much more than a philosophical book, much more than a book of philosophy. It emerged directly from this suffering. And not just that, after this period of suffering, he proceeds to have by far his most productive period as a thinker and writer. And I'm here adding, we could even say it's one of the single greatest writing sprees by any thinker ever. You know, like when we talk about athletes and we say like this single season is one of the greatest seasons played by any athlete in that sport. That's Nietzsche and his writing period after, after this painful summer. Let's say, let's see what, what he wrote. Thus spoke Zarathustra, beyond good and evil, on the genealogy of morality, the twilight of the idols, Eke Omo. He changed the course of Western philosophy, art, and literature. Again, you can hate Nietzsche. You, you don't have to love him, but give him his credit. The man changed, not just philosophy. Get educated on how many of the greatest writers, novelists, artists, of 20th century were heavily influenced by Nietzsche. So out of this heartbreak, he emerges as the Nietzsche that we know. However, this didn't happen, happen on its own. A right specific attitude was needed for it. In the same letter where he complains to the friend of the anguish and torment of, of that heartbreak, he continues and says, unless I discover the alchemical trick of turning this muck into gold, 
I am lost. So acknowledge is the necessity to do something with his suffering. And then he says, here I have the most splendid chance to prove that for me, all experiences are useful, all days holy, and all people divine. <sighs> How powerful. All, pe all experiences are useful, all days holy, and all people divine. This is a reference to his favorite thinker. And I am curious, let me know in the comments if you knew who his favorite thinker was. Ralph Waldo Emerson, American philosopher. Uh, Emerson says to the poet, to the philosopher, to the saint, all things are friendly and sacred, all events profitable, all days holy, all men divine. What both of them mean by this is that you as a rich soul, so not, not just to say poet, philosopher, saint, no, no, don't think that you literally need to be philosopher, poet, or saint. You just have to be a human who wants to nurture his or her soul and move through this life as more than just a blind fool who is being uh, controlled by external forces. So you are the philosopher, poet, and saint. What, they, what they're trying to say is that you have to make use of everything that happens to you, all the circumstances that you are thrown into. That's the person with a full soul, full heart, great mind. Not necessarily how your external accomplishments rank on the society rankings. No. What are you able to create out of the pain and suffering that you have been given? That's the greatness of the soul for both Emerson and Nietzsche. Here I have the most splendid chance. In, think about this. Think about the previous part of the letter and think about this part. Let's put it all together so that we can fully comprehend, as I said, the strength of the will and fullness of the heart. So we have this last morsel of life was the hardest I have yet had to chew. And it is still possible that I shall choke on it. I have suffered from the humiliating and tormenting memories of this summer as from a bout of madness. Then, here I have the most splendid chance, the most splendid chance to prove that for me, all experiences are useful, all days holy, all people divine. Beautiful. Greatest suffering, the most splendid chance. Think about it. Sit with this for a while. After you're done watching this video, sit, sit with this idea that your greatest suffering can be viewed, viewed as the most splendid trends. In his later works, he frequently refers to this time as the most difficult in his life, but also the one he owes the most to. He says that he owes everything that that is right and good and healthy and strong and beautiful in his, in his life, he owes it to the periods of greatest pain. Knowing how much of his philosophy revolves around overcoming suffering and creating something out of suffering, it is fair to say that he wouldn't be the great Friedrich Nietzsche that we know today without that heartbreak. Can you think about it for a moment? That one of the greatest minds in the history of philosophy was largely created by a heartbreak, motivated by a heartbreak, inspired by a heartbreak. Some of you, I think, will love, love this fact. And some of you, you want to, you want to idolize human rationality. You know, all, all of these philosophers, they are like demigods. They have those great minds and they are not mo motivated or affected by things that normal humans are? No, no. Nietzsche, again, was just like you, human being. Although smart and uh, insightful to the point of being prophetic, but still, just like you and me. How can we use his idea for our own struggles? That's what you're wondering, right? What does it mean to say that someone is a means to an, to an end in your journey to create yourself and affirm your life? This is 
whole point. What if every heartbreak, rejection and betrayal is a necessary element of your story? Let's start connecting the dots. What are we striving for? We are striving to be able to say yes to our life and everything that ever happened in our life. We want to be humans of full and great heart and soul and make use of everything and say that all events are useful, all days are holy, all, all people, people are divine. So in that context, every heartbreak, rejection, every betrayal is necessary. You cannot wish for it to disappear out of your life, out of your memory, out of your past. Could it mean that if you're affirming yourself today, if today you want to say yes to your life, if today you want to say yes to yourself or wish to affirm yourself in the future, it's not possible without affirming all of those painful experiences and more importantly, all of those people who, who were involved in those experiences. Maybe simple when we break it down, hopefully, I made it simple by breaking it down, but I'm not saying it's easy, just to acknowledge that. If at any point in your life you can say a passionate yes to who you are and what your life is, you must recognize that all of those people were means to you arriving at that point. Okay, now we have a real reframing of that idea. They were not means as objects that you use and discard, no. You are not dehumanizing them, no. But they were means in the sense that they were necessary for you to become a person who, person that you are today. They were necessary means, components, elements to the story that led you to becoming who you are today and saying, yes, I love my life. I love this story and I would relive this story over and over and over and over again. Without those people who have hurt you, betrayed you, left you, broke your heart. And the experiences of heartbreak, suffering, pain, anguish, anxiety that they produced, no matter how painful those experience, experiences were, you wouldn't be the person who is saying yes. You wouldn't be the person who would live their life over and over again. Okay. This is the, maybe, the most important part. A lot of you are watching this and you say, this sounds great, but I'm not that person right now who is saying yes to myself and my life. I don't like myself. I don't like my life. If that's the case, let me know in the comments. Let me know in the comments uh, and maybe provide some, some context. Hopefully, I can, I can reply in, in a more personalized ma manner. But... If you are that person who says, okay, but this doesn't work for me, everything that you said doesn't make sense because I am not still that person who can say yes to themselves, who can, uh, still cannot affirm their life in its entirety. No, no, the situation is still the same. The question is, do you want to say yes? Do you want to love your life? Do you want to affirm your life? Do you want to affirm eternal recurrence? Do you want to be the f person who can say yes to all of their life? Do you? Do you want it? You want it. Okay. Then your current present, so who you are right now and what your life is right now, is a necessary component of the future that you are trying to create. So once you arrive in that future, what is present right now will be the past at that point. I'm, I, I'm hoping I'm not too confusing. So you need to affirm this, this right now. You as you are right now and your life as it is right now, sooner or later, you have to affirm it. Okay, so in order to affirm who you are right now and what your life is right now, you, you cannot do that without affirming the past. So again, it's all sooner or later, you have to do it. So you might as well do it now. If you feel that you are not where you want to be, that's fine. Don't affirm yourself as, yes, I love my life as it is right now because I have accomplished a lot and I'm this ultimate version of myself. No, affirm yourself as a person who recognizes the idea that every single 
thing that happened in your life is necessary for the process of self-creation. Affirm yourself in that way. And then you will be creating the future where when you say yes, it's a yes of full love, content, satisfaction, sense of accomplishment. You will get to that point. However, your present must be affirmed. As long as you want to be able to love yourself and your life in the future, you cannot escape affirming your past. You see? So you cannot change this equation. You cannot have one without the other. All of your life, if you want to love it and affirm it, comes in a package. You cannot pick and choose your life experiences and your life chapters. You have to love the whole story. There is no need to dehumanize people from your past and say that they were just means to descend because that you don't want to be that person. No matter how, how much someone hurt you, you don't want to be the person and say, yeah, they were just means to, uh, to an end. If you want, fine. I'm just saying, I think you don't want to be that person coming from a place to, to, to uh, nurture resentment in your heart, to nurture uh, disrespecting other people. Maybe they have disrespected you, but there is no need for you to go down to their level. They don't think of them as the just means, but they were means for development of your story. If it sounds better, I say here, call them necessary elements of your story instead of means. Instead of looking back on them with resentment and pain in your heart, today or at some point in your story, you will like look back with a smile and say, you played a part in me becoming who I am and I love who I am, so thank you. And I know for some of you who are going through a heartbreak right now, especially if you were betrayed or hurt, you cannot imagine saying thank you to that person. Trust me, trust me, you can. I'm not making this video because I find this an uh, interesting intellectual topic, no. I find be I, I'm interested in talking about this because just like you, I have been heartbroken. I made another video about it and I shared that I've spent like a year dreaming about that person every single day. But now at this point, the only thing that I could say is thank you. But other than that, I really, I, I don't see any emotional connection to that person. After years of, of thinking that I will never be able to overcome that heartbreak. So at this moment, it sounds unreasonable, even, even offensive to you. When I suggest that you, one day you will say thank you to them, maybe not directly, but in your own mind, maybe it sounds ridiculous, offensive, outrageous, but trust me, trust me, if you engage in the process of self-creation, if you go on the journey of learning to love your life, the story of your life, one day you will be at such a good place in your mind and heart that you will look back on them and say, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for teaching me a lesson. Thank you for giving me uh, necessary ingredients to become who I am today. And thank you for filtering yourself out of my life by, by being cruel to me or whatever they did. You will arrive there. I know you can arrive at this point. However, however, it won't happen on its own. And that's the most important part. This is something, listen, this is now the most important part. I'm not saying all of this, doing all of this preparation, trying to deliver this message in a clear way for you to think that, yeah, I'm going to watch this and things are going to happen on their own. No. It's not enough to believe that one day you will be able to say yes to yourself and your life and make peace with all the pain you've been through. You cannot just wait for it. No. You never, never, never think for a second that you can just wait for everything to fall 
into into its place into its right place without you making any effort and taking any action you know everything happens for a reason we are often uh, we are often told that everything happens for a reason exactly when we are going through heartbreak you know people console us and say you know everything happens for a reason you know one day you will look back on it and it will be okay mm -hmm. uh, you cannot hope that one day you will realize and say oh wow yeah, everything was for a reason no it doesn't go like that how how do we arrive at the point where everything was for a reason and what do you think is the reason who do you think creates that reason every single time things ended up happening for a reason it was because of the person you became and not because of all of a sudden all of a sudden a single thing happened and justified all the previous pain and struggle you are the reason let me say it again you are the reason you always was always were the reason you will always be the reason everything happens for a reason <laughs> think think back think back uh, on your life and remember one instance where you said yeah yeah now i get it everything was for a reason and tell me was it a blessing from a sky that your life was kind of rearranged the story of your life was rearranged and everything made sense or did you become a new person did your life become better through your own effort and you said yeah that challenge obstacle suffering pain they were for a reason because look at me now look at my life now that's the only way that things happen for a reason if you ever met a person who's been through a lot of pain but is now able to smile and be happy with who they are and what their life is you will notice one thing in common with all of them they all took the story called their life into their own hands they didn't wait for the reason the reason to fall into their lap they created themselves remember self-creation Nietzsche's self-creation they created themselves into individuals into characters who cannot help but say yes everything was for a reason and that reason is me as i am right now and my life as it is In the words of a person who tried to do that the person who wanted you and me to engage in the process of self-creation and become the reasons in his words and all my creating and striving amounts to this that i create and piece together into one what is now fragment and riddle and grisly accident once again, on my creating and striving, how did we start this conversation? A human being who strives for something great. On my striving, creating, self-creation. All my creating and striving amounts to this. That I create and piece together into one. What is your life right now? A mess of obstacles, challenges, pain, betrayal, suffering, disappointment, heartbreak. A mess where all of these things are separated. They're all random events that somehow all happen to you. I create and piece together. I take all of this and piece, put together, piece together into one, into one story. What is now fragment and riddle and grisly accident. Fragment, riddle, grisly accident. All of this, all of this mess, fragment, riddle, grisly accident. I put it together into one into one story that makes sense into a coherent narrative i said it many times and i will keep saying it if your life is not a story what is it if you're not a character in the story of your life who are you what are you doing you can do this i know it hurts but with time you can you can create and piece together all that pain all that grisly accident riddle again disappointment pain betrayal hurt anxiety suffering you can take all of it create piece together into one into something beautiful something that you will look and say yes yes i love this and i would relive this story over and over and over and over again yes you got this.
you do. Don't. I don't want to sense any lack of energy in you. This uh, discouragement. No. You you got this. You can create. You can create your life and yourself. Short note, I made another video on heartbreak that a lot of people found helpful. I've heard that if Nietzsche watched it in 8082, you know, he would feel a bit better. But you see, he already did well and maybe he didn't need any help because he, as we said, as we saw, produced a lot of great works from, from that suffering. So yeah, I mean, if you want to check this video, your heartbreak is unique, but also the same like everyone else's. I think uh, if you watch it, you will receive both compassion and also a wake-up call reality check. So maybe it's, it's useful if you're if you're struggling, and if you feel you need something more than what I what I said here. Congratulations, you have a top one percent attention span. And considering this topic, the way that I have dove deep into it, that we have to that we had to approach it from multiple angles the length and the way that I'm speaking, maybe it's not that you're top 1% attention span, maybe you're top 0.2% uh, attention span. So really, congratulations. Uh, here's my challenge. Think about, okay, having such a high, uh, high level attention span is a superpower in today's world. How are you going to use it? Again, this is not flattery. These are just facts. Hard facts that Less than 1% of people are able to sit through a video of this sort. Thank you. I am honored that you decided to invest your time and energy and attention into listening to me. Honored and I will try to repay you by giving all of my time, energy and attention into producing more, more value for you. Educational value so that we can grow together. If you found, found this valuable, subscribe and share with at least one friend who is going through a heartbreak or still hasn't moved on from a breakup that happened a long time ago. And you know very well that you have you have that friend. So please share with them. Again, I, I'm hoping that it's not just a one-way street, so I, you will be helping them. Yes, you will be helping me, of course, just to make it clear, you will be helping me, but I'm truly confident that you will be helping them by sharing this video. So let's do it, let's do it. Let's grow together, help each other out and spread spread some messages of empowerment, encouragement, uh, hope in the potential of human beings to deal with everything that life throws at them and move, move forward and upward towards their highest potentials. Lastly, stay strong, love life, and never feel sorry for yourself. Thank you.